Welcome back to the Four Men Podcast, where we are diving into James chapter five today. I got my brother in law Jacob Parker and Luke with me. Reeves uh, decided to bail last moment, and uh, uh, John Luke had to do a phone call. So, uh, Jacob, uh, tell people who you are for anyone who's curious listening. Um, I'm Jacob Mayo. I'm uh, 24. <laughs> um, my birthday is July 22nd, 1999. Um, <laughs> I'm like a buck, 185 maybe. Okay. All right, Parker. <laughs> I was just giving y'all my stats for when I give you my next stats when I get done with the PDF. You know, <laughs> he just came out with one. Y'all should get it. Uh, you can read the Bible and also get gains. So, I mean, what's better than gains with the Lord and gains with the bros? You know what I'm saying? So, hey. Just get it all. Get it That's all. so true. It's all in one package here. My name is Parker. Christian and I went to college together at Auburn University. Or Eagle. Or Eagle. That's right. Um, but my wife and I, we moved here about two years ago. Um, my wife, uh, Freddie, works alongside Sadie, and I work at Buck Commander. So good friends with uh, everybody around here. So thanks for having me. Yeah. And I'm your host. I'm Christian. I'm just joking. All right, Luke. Uh, yeah. I'm uh, Luke Albritton. Um, uh, man, Christian and I met, what, four years ago? Three, yep. four years four ago. Years ago. Then Park Daddy and I met three or four years ago, and then... Brother Mayo here, we've met. Reverend. Yeah. So anyways, we're all family here and uh, just grateful to be here and to be a part of this ministry. And uh, so, yeah. Let's dive into it. James chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away and your fine clothes are moth-eaten rags. Your gold and silver are corroded. The very wealth that you are counting on will eat away your flesh like fire. This corroded treasure you have hoarded will testify against you on the day of judgment. For listen, hear the cries of the field workers whom you have cheated of their pays. The cries of those who harvest your fields have reached the ears of the Lord of heavens. You have spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. You have fattened yourselves for the day of slaughter. You have condemned and killed innocent people who do not resist you. Dear brothers and sisters, be patient as you wait for the Lord's return. Consider the farmers who patiently wait for the rains in the fall and in the spring. They eagerly look for the valuable harvest to ripen. You too must be patient. Take courage for the coming of the Lord is near. Don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged. For look, the judge is standing at the door. For examples of patience and suffering, dear brothers and sisters, look at the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. We give great honor to those who endure under suffering. For instance, you know about Job, a man of great endurance, You can see how the Lord was kind to him at the end, for the Lord is full of tenderness and mercy. But most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or by earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not sin and be condemned. All right, Jakey Daniel. Oh, well, we're just skipping Parker and Liz. (laughs) I don't know, I'm doing a little circle. Bro, this is an X factor. This is crazy. What stuck out to you? Um, I would say probably like don't grumble about each other, brothers and sisters, or you will be judged for the judge is standing at the door. And like probably, um, but most of all, which is this verse 12, and that other one was verse 9, is but most of all, my brothers and sisters, never take an oath by heaven or earth or anything else. Just say a simple yes or no so that you will not be, uh, so it will not be a sin and you will not be condemned. I just think those are pretty simple, which obviously this uh, passage is definitely directed towards. Uh, somebody I don't know exactly does anyone have the background information on who like James is talking to here I mean I know he's talking to us reading it but also like is there we right into it to the church just the church as a whole um, like what civilization or I guess would be the word um, I do remember it is Jewish Christians I'm trying to remember and read where the where they were from stand by yeah. But, I mean, they're pretty simple. I mean, just don't grumble about each other. Obviously, he's pretty much saying, like, I would guess gossiping or talking down on each other, you know. And then also, don't take an oath, just a simple yes. You don't have to, like, pledge your allegiance to anything or to the culture, I guess, would be, like, the way I would read that, you know. So Not that, bowing down. That would be an example of, like, instead of saying yes or no, you would say, like, I swear I'm going to do this. Yeah, thing. like, I swear I'm going to do this or, like, uh, by the king or like I swear to the king or you know all hell the king I, mean, I don't know like what their culture is I read this I read this commentary on it and it said uh, 
It said, the Bible does not forbid the swearing of all oaths, only against the swearing of deceptive, unwise, or flippant oaths. So I think I think that last word for me, like flippant, you know, I think sometimes we can be so flippant with things. Can we get um, a definition there? Like Reeves yesterday, I swear I'm going to be there tomorrow, and he's not here. Oh, okay. <laughs> Sorry, Reeves. I'm just no. joking. Reeves had to go. Uh, Mo some lawns, and John Luke had a phone call this morning at this time. So that is why those two are not here. I'm sorry that you're disappointed. I'm subbing in sorry. alternate style. Yeah. Jacob, uh, Jacob's commentary takes up two people. So Yeah, so that would cut some here. people out. <laughs> yeah, I think the flipping oaths, I think that's kind of what's like, let your yes be yes or let your no be no. For sure. I think sometimes we can just, you know, say things off the cusp and not really mean it. Yeah, and I feel like if you do take that to whole, like jumping off, piggyback what you're saying, I feel like it's more powerful than you think when your yes is yes always and your no is no. I think it's just a powerful thing if you look back at it. Just yeah. being a man of your word. It's a big thing in today's culture. I feel like there's not a lot of people that are man of their word. You gotta be a man of your word. I can get lost in the sauce, son. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a note here in my study Bible, obviously. James is referring to what Jesus said, I believe, in Matthew 5. Verse 37 says, let what you say be simply yes or no. Anything more than this comes from the evil one. Um, I saw a little interesting note here in the study section of my Bible. It says, up to Jesus' disciples are not to swear at all based on that verse. Instead, their character should be of such integrity that their words can be believed without an oath. Which kind of speaks to that. You don't That's have good. to swear by that. I guess if you look to more in the Old Testament, like oaths were such a bigger thing than they are now, I guess, in my way, like, and say, I make an oath to you that I'm going to do this or that, you know. So I think that's a little context of the time, too. Yeah. Exactly, because they don't have, like, that's all that you had back then. I mean, maybe that they had some, like, hieroglyphics or something, you know, writing on paper. But, like, that's like your contract. Like, that's mm-hmm. like if you call somebody and be like, hey, Christian, I want to go work out. Like, you're an oath to them. It's just as much reliable as being able to call somebody right. today. Why do we, like, growing up, you know, it was always, like, if I think back to, like, elementary school, or like middle school, is uh, you know you didn't like swear on somebody's life. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Swear my mom's grave. I swear my like, <laughs> mom. Where did that right? even come from? Yeah. <laughs> well, like when I read that, I just think about that. Like being ten and be like, I swear on my on my dad's life. On my grandma. It's like you know what, what, what does that even mean? Like, I'm mean, ten doing that. I mean, Doesn't make any sense. That's a big bounty, son. When you say that, it's a big bounty. But then you said verse nine too. Yeah, just the don't, don't grumble. grumble. Yeah, it's, like, it's another simple one, which I could be taken out of context. But also, just it's easy, like, don't grumble about each other. Obviously, it's not going to do us no good if me and Luke are, like, outside of here grumbling about you and Parker or vice versa. Like, obviously, not going to benefit our lives any, you know. It's only going to be worse. Yeah, I wonder what the word grumble is in the, like, original text. Like, if he's meaning, like, gossip or, like, if he's meaning judge. He says, don't grumble about each other. What century do you think this is? Or you will be judged. I don't know all the century stuff. Just saying, it'd be funny. Or the 21st century. I'd love to hear audio of them grumbling back back then. Would this be like first century? Oh, yeah, for sure. <laughs> for sure. Come on now. I mean, think about it. If he was alive when Jesus was. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I don't, I just, I don't know all the, right. the nuances of yeah. century talk. Me neither. That's why I just latched on to Parker when he said first century. I said, that's a good idea. <laughs> Look what you got. Uh, I guess kind of in the first part, kind of what we were talking about is, like, James is not condemning, like, the wealthy people. but the Because you think about it, it's, it's wealthy people within the church. Right. But it's what these people are doing with their wealth. And so mm-hmm. that's good. It's, it's painting a picture of right. what we see today, too, within <clears throat> churches is, like people are associated with the Christian faith that do have all these things, but don't use them for the good of the kingdom, yeah. seeking the kingdom of God. Right. right. So I think that's a big thing to point out for us is like God, God doesn't, it's not that he doesn't want us to be wealthy. It's like, how do we use the resources that he does give us? And I think yeah. what has happened here and James is pointing out all these people have stored up all these things that, things of this world right. mm-hmm. but they profess that they love jesus and that they, they're coming to church and they right. have the faith right. but then at the end of their life they're in misery because they've done put, they've stored their treasure up and i think yeah. in colossians it talks about setting your mind on things above not in this world and i think that's 
what he's what he's saying because my subtitle says warning to the ridge and so, so it's, a um, yeah. it's like hey pay attention because of you set your mind and i think i, I know i've seen this in my life it's like and even in the faith, it's like I can put my faith in like my wife to do this or expectations or I can put my trust like y'all are going to do this. But like we're going to fail each other because we're imperfect people. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, but in the same thing, that's what he talks about, how the, the gold and silver corrodes and the corrosion will be evidence against you. Like all these things will be gone at some point in life. Right. And so what can you hang your hat up on right. on your deathbed? And so uh, that was my first thoughts on that first little yeah, that's oh, good. That is good. I kind of did like a little. So I have in verse three, I kind of circled some words with some themes. If you kind of look at the first couple, so the the very wealth you were counting on. So I circled counting and kind of wrote comfort. So you find you're finding a comfort in wealth because you can count on it. And then if you look at verse four, um whom you have cheated of their pay, so unfair. So you're not only wealthy, but you're comfortable in your wealth and you're you're unfair to people. You, you're, you're cheating people. And then if you go back to five, or if you go four to five, it says you've spent your years on earth in luxury, satisfying your every desire. So I circled satisfying your every desire. So comfort again. So you have, you're counting on your wealth, you've cheated, you've cheated people and you're satisfying every desire. So just that theme of, you know, that's the warning. It's you're counting on this. You're cheating other people. So you're being unfair and you're just, you're comfortable. You're, yeah. yes, you have access. So in doing so, you're, you're, you're satisfying your every desire. So mm-hmm. I thought that was kind of, a, of an interesting kind of theme throughout the first couple of verses. Mm-hmm. It makes me think of like control as in like, let's say you're rich and then you have all this money where like things don't matter. I guess essentially so you can kind of control your situation with your money and your wealth, you know, like controlling your atmosphere. So you're never kind of like challenged. <clears throat> this is what made me think of when you're saying all that, just like the comfortable, like, of like, Oh, I, I have enough money, but I'm going to, you know, jip these workers for me and not pay them. Right. It's like doing your, I guess like doing what the Lord would do if he had a lot of money, I guess, like looking at it in that way, like paying your people enough, if not extra, you know, like blessing people, just like the Lord blessed you. Like, with everything that you had. I know that it is an uncomfortable subject to talk about, but it's something that we must address, and that is the elephant in the room, which is pornography. Pornography is something that is huge in our culture today. It is huge in our world and our society. And um, it is something that most, all people have struggled with or wrestled with at some point in their life. And me especially, uh, throughout high school, early on in college, um, I've talked about this on the podcast before, but I... Um, just really wrestled with this and really had a grasp on my life. And uh, I wrestled with it for so long because I didn't want to talk to anybody about it. I didn't have um, people around me to, to hold me accountable. I didn't have people that I felt like I could go confess these things to, to really pull me out of it. So I kind of just sat in it and uh, I really wrestled with it for a while. And it wasn't until I finally got help uh, from my close guy friends and really until I started to confess it, that I really found freedom in it. And that's why I love Covenant Eyes so much. And here is something that can help you from our friends at Kevin and us. Strive. It's a free 21-day porn detox. And this program removes the fluff and focuses on the things that matter most when it comes to quitting porn, saving you time and giving you the tools that you need to find freedom. And the great thing about the Strive program is that you're not alone in this. There's a band of brothers from all around the world right now on this journey with you. So are you ready to live as a man of integrity? Get started on your path to recovery with Strive, a free 21-day digital detox for men by visiting strive21.com or by clicking on the link in the show notes today. That's strive21.com. And I think that goes back to <clears throat> let your yes be yes and your no be no. Because you think about like we were talking about in school, like you knew the kids or like if it was even us, like when you had to go to the extent of saying, I swear on my mother's grave or like I swear to God. Like I think that's mm-hmm. what he's saying. Like a lot of times you couldn't believe them anyways because they were having to repeatedly right, say right, right, like right. the same thing. And you're like, Mm-hmm. I don't know if I can, but if somebody says, Hey, looks you in the eyes and says, this is what I'm going to do. And like, this is my yes and my no. And you don't have to go to the extent of trying to make somebody believe you're telling them the truth right. is. And I think that's in, you know, you think of integrity and like what that looks like today in, the, in this world. Like there's integrity is not a thing anymore. No, uh, you know, when somebody says they're going to do something, 
there's you know unless it's your group of friends or family right, really like, trust. and even yeah. family like there you know you have to just integrity and that's what like this is built on like what Jesus he lived his life for and like what he stood for and he never backed down for what you know he believed and lived his life out to be so I'm going to read this real quick in Colossians um <clears throat> Colossians 3, it says, If you've been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things that are above, not on the things of this earth. For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also appear with him in glory. So it's this obviously is talking about old self becoming a new creation and setting the old ways behind you, but still can apply to this here in James of talking about material things and, you know, and I, I was thinking about that concept and just the world that we live in with material things being such a push down your throat mm -hmm. with success and what success revolves around having a lot of something. If it's a lot of hunting land, if it's a lot of money, if it's a lot of real estate, whatever it is, you know, uh, but it's like, I try to look at my life. If I have those things, does that change my life like in the fact yeah. of I'm I'm more happy or and every time I go back to that it does like it's a temporary thing that never lasts right and so when I can truly say I can hang my hat on the joy that Jesus brings me every day mm -hmm. and when I do have success or I do like God do, does bless me with these things all right let's take this and how can we either further the kingdom with it how can we do something to help somebody out or Take these resources mm -hmm. and use them for his good, you know. And so that's, that's, good. that's, that's a hard good. thing for me to always want to do because I'm yeah. selfish by nature. Uh, you sure. know? So obviously this is what happened. And he goes into that. James does it talking about the farmer. And that kind of goes into judgment and when Jesus is coming back type deal too. But That's good. I like it when you said hang your hat on it. That's what I was thinking earlier. Like at night. Like, just hanging your hat. you hang your hat on, like, everything you've done in the day or, like, all your assets? Or do you hang your hat on just, like, what the Lord's done and just, you know, lay down at night in peace or worrying about tomorrow kind of deal? Yeah. Through all that, obviously, I think we've probably mentioned this several times. So I just feel like there's been a lot of parallels to the Sermon on the Mount through James over and over. So I thought about when Jesus used the same language in Matthew uh, 6, starting in verse 19, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroy, and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. And it's wild, like, in the beginning, in verse 2, my translation says, your riches have rotted and your garments are moth-eaten. It's some of the same language. And again, it's just like, are we really living for this life or are we living for the next one? You know, like, what is your... Like the language of you have lived on this earth in luxury and self-indulgence. You know, what's your heart with your resources? Yeah. You know, is it just for me? Like, is it just to serve right. myself and what I want? Right. Or is it to serve others in, in God's kingdom? Because like you said, Luke, it's so oftentimes I think about, man, if I could just get this thing or do this thing, like, yeah. that'll be great. Like, I've made it or I'll be happy. Yeah. And every time you get to that point, it's like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. I make what's it so next? good for a minute. And then what's, it's like, yeah, oh, well. They didn't give me what I thought it was. Like, yeah. What's next? <laughs> yeah. No, I definitely get that. Yeah, I mean, if you think these verses are harsh, it's like Jesus said it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle right. than it right. is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of heaven. But no, these are, I mean, I really do wrestle with, you know, a lot of these verses. And I, th I think sometimes it can be super easy, you know, because when you hear somebody rich, you instantly think of a billionaire or like somebody super, super wealthy. But, like, you know, there's a bunch of different, like, kind of contexts of it or, you know, some some different things. But, like, by and large, you know, just from, like, a lot of research I did, and, and we talk about this kind of often. But, I mean, if you make $60,000 a year, you're in the top 1% of, like, the world's wealth, you know? And it's like, so when you read this text, if you live in the U S and you, you know, and if you make 30,000 a year, then you're in the top 6%. Like, so, you know, I just feel like this, I feel like these texts can be easy and you can think about other people, but not necessarily, you know, always mm -hmm. think about yourself. Right. And it's like, no, if you live, you know, 
culturally in the U.S. or, you know, if you make a decent amount of money, which, like I said, if you make any one of those two, you're in the top 1% to 6% of, like, the world's wealth. Right. Which that this verse applies to you. Yeah. Because no, that's the thing, too. It's like he's not, I mean, which he, I mean, Weep and groan with anguish because of all the terrible troubles ahead of you. I think sometimes, I think that can be, I think that could be my wrestle because it's, you know, it's not necessarily bad to have money, but it's like, you know, it's just what you do with it. Because I mean, there can be times where I can be comfortable because of, you know, something that we do where it's a deal or whatever, and it's like, you know, that's just human nature, mm-hmm. right? If you get a pay raise or if you get more you know, deals to go spray stuff for drones. It's like, you, there can be a sense of like comfort in that, Yeah. you know, but it's consistently bringing that to God and trying to rebuke that and, you know, ask for those, ask for those different convictions. But I think that's the thing I can wrestle with at times. Cause it's like, cause sometimes it can come across as bad to have money, you know, but, I, but it's not the case yeah. because, you know, if if we're called to be a light in the darkness, I think you can be a huge light in the darkness if you do have a lot of money. Mm-hmm. You know, if you have wealth, you can use it to better poverty or like you can do all these good things with it instead of buying the next, you know, big thing. I, so I think like though I agree totally with what you're saying. I think the thing is with money, it's just like I think when you have that asset of money, because that's what I would say money is a tool. I say when you have that asset, I feel like you're way more susceptible to like, ha- like you have to be hard and like have a group of guys around you. Or if we're saying this just to men, like you have to have a group of guys around you. Or your heart, I feel like, is way easier to get because mm-hmm. like to get in a trap or get in somewhere where you get jaded or this or that. Because like when you have money, you, you're accessible to a lot of other things. Like you, you can do anything essentially. If you depend on the amount of money and what your life looks like, what I'm saying, like the more mm-hmm. money you have, the more temptations, the more things you can do and spend your money on, and like feed the flesh essentially. It's like keeping your heart in check and knowing where the money comes from. I feel like a good thing for me is like no matter how much money you make, if you look at your money, like everything that's good comes from the Lord. That's a mm-hmm. that's a verse. So it's like anything that's good comes from the Lord. So it's like if you keep that in check, I feel like. It's a good reminder to just like, yeah. oh, this is not me. Like, God's allowing me. Like, mm-hmm. yes, I'm working, like, at whatever I'm doing that makes me successful, I'm working at it as I would for the Lord, as that mm-hmm. verse says too, as well. But everything flows from the Lord. So it's like looking at where your blessings come from mm-hmm. instead of like looking at, like, what did I do to get this? Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Like, God allowed all of us to have the ability to be good at what we're good at, whether it's spraying a drone like starting new businesses having good at communication whether it's working out mm-hmm. and being able to you know talk to people through working out whether it's you know making deals and like having relationships in the business world like god allowed us to have all these attributes to make us successful in those ways whatever success looks like because success to me is also like you said in america like thirty thousand dollars in america at most people if you said i made thirty thousand dollars no one would bat an eye but like in six percent of the whole world, if we're looking at it in that perspective, it's a totally different ball game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you know, like think about how much advantages. This is all I was thinking about when I read this verse. I felt convicted personally because it's not even. I wouldn't even say it's that I'm the richest person ever. Because I, I mean, and I'm only saying that to make the point of like, where is my heart at? Like, all mm-hmm. oh, the things I want to do in the future, like warning to the rich. Like, let's say potentially a goal of mine was to be rich. I'm not saying that's what it is, but like, where's my heart at in that? Is it to just make money and have worldly desires of things that I want? Or is it to like doing that through like helping people and like, where am I spending my money? Where am I putting like my heart and mind to? Like, is it for things of the Lord or things of like self-righteousness and like self-indulgence, I guess. I don't know. That's kind of like where my mind is at on the rabbit hole of all the things that you said. Taking care of your health is not always easy, but it should at least be simple. And that's why for the last three plus years, I've been drinking AG1 every single morning, no exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water every single day. I think it tastes delicious. I uh, love all the health benefits it gives me. And I hate taking pills. I don't like taking vitamins. And especially in the mornings, I don't like taking a lot of caffeine before I, or before I work out early in the morning. So AG1 is a perfect supplement for me to drink in the mornings. Like I said, it helps my gut health. It gives me energy. I feel more focused when I drink it. And I just feel like overall my health 
It's just better when I drink it. And that's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. And over the last couple of years, I've gotten so many people on my family to drink AG1. Sadie, my wife, loves to drink it in the mornings. I've got my dad on it now. He loves to drink it uh, in the early afternoons. And I was in town last week with my family. And my grandma came up to me and asked, was asking me all about AG1. And now she is on the train. So now she has started to drink AG1 and she loves it as well. So I've gotten a bunch of people in my family over the years on AG1. And with AG1, I know that I'm getting a quality product. And AG1's ingredients are sourced for nutrient density, absorption, and potency. And every single batch goes through rigorous testing. So if there is one product that I had to recommend to elevate your health, it's AG1. And that's why I've been partnered with them for so long. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase exclusively at drinkag1.com slash huff. That's drinkag1.com slash huff. Go check it out. Let me read this. First Timothy uh, chapter six. Verse 10? Uh, yeah, yeah. Let's go. I had that one written down. Come on. Well, it's actually six through 10. Did you look at my notes? Bro. I, I wish I could. The power of the Spirit, baby. Come All on. All right, here we go. So, uh, but godliness with contentment is great gain, for we brought nothing into this world and we can't take anything out of it. But if we have food and clothing, with these things we can be content. But with those who desire to be rich, fall into temptation, into a snare, and into many senseless and harmful de- des- desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money, and that's big for the love of money, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. is the root of all kinds of evil. It is through this craving that some have wandered from the faith and pierced themselves from many pangs. So it's uh, from the start here, it's like, what does contentment look like? And what is being satisfied with what we have and what we do get? And then the the big thing is, I think Christian and Jacob, what y'all are saying is wealth in this world today, most people we see that are wealthy aren't doing good things for yeah, them, right, or right. they're not yeah. they're not following Jesus. And right. so like it's that reputation of like if you do have wealth or things of this world, yeah. it's almost a stigma like, well, they're probably not good people. They're probably right. you know, they're full of themselves and because they exactly. do. And so it's the big part of and I think that's this is very clear when Paul is telling and Paul is speaking to Timothy as a son right, right. here. So like this is a father looking out of a for a son type mentality. And so he says the love of money. And so that's, we can, it's a big catch. Right it's a there. big thing of like if the love or desire, and that's what James is saying, those things that we store up and that we just truly seek after. Right. And we put those into our heart. And then that's where he's saying, when Jesus comes back, when we're groaning and moaning of like, man, I thought I had all the things I thought I did all the things right. And I was a good person. And, um, uh, but that was, that's that verse there, boy. That's, no, that's so good. That's good. That's good. Because he says godliness is where great can, or godliness, when that, when godliness and contentment meets, there's great gain with that. Right. And so, like, success is in the eye of the holder of what that looks like. And so, you can look at the, um, dang it, not the woman at the well, uh, the lady that gave all she had or whatever. Mm, what so, is my? Yeah. So, like, you look at what she gave and what Jesus' response was that she gave all she had. And so her right. heart. And so it's, and I, this is something I've had to tell myself is like, God, seek my heart out because I know that I'm selfish and I know that I have desires that I don't want to have, but know my intentions mm-hmm. are truly like, I have to, like, cause I think obviously we know he knows my heart, but it's like, God, search that out and know, like, yeah, I need you more and more every day. Right. Yeah. But also, like, know where my intentions and where my heart is with things so no that's good that verse is slamming well because yeah. what are you gonna say i was gonna say it, it's something that i've been challenged to think about i like from the lord in regards to money and possessions all that lately is like all we have really isn't ours anyways yeah you know yeah. like it really is the lord's if we're truly surrendered to him like we say we are and we're supposed to be right like right if you think of it like that like it's not ours anyways, you know. It's like, in my mind, it's like, man, it increases the responsibility to steward that. Right. No. In a way that's honoring to him, you know. Like, it's different if, like, Luke, if I borrowed your shotgun to go turkey hunting, I would treat it probably with a lot more care than if it was my own. Or right. your vehicle to go yeah, yeah, move yeah. something, right? The analogy goes on and on. But mm-hmm. 
it's that kind of mindset like man this is actually god's money this is actually his, oh, that's good his resources oh this is his thing he's like what am i really doing with that am i wasting it it's like the parable of the talents right like that was God's where I was going, us, bro. Yeah, God's given us all these. Oh, stealing all my stuff. All these, gifts, oh, yeah. all these cons First step up. Are we burying it in the ground? And, I let him go. And leaving it, or are we being faithful with oh, that's, it? So, so that's, that's the that's tension. Good. But that's, the, that, that's what I'm trying to say. That's the tension for me in it, though. Yeah. Because, like, I do believe that God wants us to have money. Yeah, I do sure. believe he wants us to work hard. I think that, like, like mm-hmm. you said, that's the parable of the talents. Like, who's the one he rebukes? He rebukes the one that goes and. Buries, in the, buries it in the ground, doesn't do anything with it. Like he wants you to, you know, like he praised the one who went and, you know, right. del- I, can't, I can't remember if it's doubled it or, or whatever, whatever the percentages were on it. But like, that's what I'm saying. He doesn't rebuke the one that goes out and makes more money. He rebukes the one that doesn't, he's that, you know, that sits, that's, on that's, it. that sits with it and that's not a good steward with right. it. So, cause I think I can read that and be like, you know, you shouldn't have money. And if you have money, right. then, be careful because, but, but there are all so many good things. You know, you can't serve yeah. two masters. You can't serve both God and money. But I do think that the par- the parable, of the talents, <clears throat> it does kind of provide some kind of contrast to it. Of but like, yeah. Do you do like you should go work hard? You should go try to right. Make, like, oh. there's not bad I, things in that. But yeah. it's when yeah. it becomes self indulgent. When it becomes mm-hmm. you cheating people. When it becomes. Right. You know that's what you're counting on. Then that's when it gets that's when it gets in trouble. But I do think that you should go try to make all the money you want. Go work hard. Go mm-hmm. go be generous with it. Um, because yeah, I think the parable of the talents. Yeah, I think that proves the context of that. Right. Yeah. Who does I would, God rebuke? Yeah, I would I would agree with what you're saying, but I think it all lies on the thing of like what is the percep like going back like what's the perception of money like what's your perception like is it like if i make let's just say i make sixty thousand dollars is that my identity like is that my life like is that the goal you know what i'm saying or am i just working hard and like let's just say so happens what i do that i love to do and working hard is thirty thousand dollars you know it's like what does that look like i feel like it's a heart check of like what are you working towards like i feel like if you're working towards being like literal rich, whatever that looks like, I feel like that's totally different because somebody could be just as happy working hard for 60000 and they're rich, but not only rich in money, but in joy and like content with the Lord. Like I just think it, you kind of have to have like, I feel like talk to God and like figure out what that thing is, I guess would be like, I guess what I'm trying to go with that is like, all oh, that's so different. Like, cause like yeah. anyone listening there's a number in their head that what they consider rich. Right. I'm saying like rich is just so many different ball games across the board. Like somebody could just be rich as long as they have a meal on their plate and money in their pocket for gas, you know, mm-hmm. and a plan for tomorrow. So it just depends on like what that looks like for you, like what that God given thing for you looks like and like contentment and what you were raised like, I feel like, if that makes any sense. Totally. Mm. But I do definitely agree because God says, like, work at anything as you would for the Lord. I know we all can be convicted mm-hmm. at that. There's things I don't want to do, don't want to do, and I know I don't go, hey, look, I should work at this like I do for the Lord. No, I'm like, dang, I don't want to do this. Yeah. You know, so. Yeah, you go look at Job uh, and his life, and this Job chapter 1, he says, uh, and this is Satan talking to God here, and they're going back in conversation, but he says, Have you not put a hedge around him in his house and all he has on every side? You've blessed his work of his hands, and you've given him possessions that have increased in his land, but you stretch out your hand and touch all he has, and he'll curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your hands. Only against him do not stretch your ha- hand on him. So Satan went out of the presence of the Lord. So the first thing there is obviously, like it says, God bless the works of his hands. So there's something Job obviously had to do in order. But it says he was a blameless and upright man in in chapter 1. But then verse 20 says, then Job, so this is, if you read on, Satan takes his property and his children die. And then he says, Job arose, tore off his robe, and shaved his head. He fell on the ground and worshiped, and he said, Naked I come into my mother's wound, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And all this Job didn't sin. And so I think about, <clears throat> like, because of, like, this this action, like, Job was still worshiping the Father right. and the fact that he took everything. that. So this tells me Job's heart wasn't in his, right. like, and it sounds really tough, but, he was truly seeking after God because of 
like his children just died. He just lost all his possessions, all of his wealth, like his character even. Yeah. Like, But I, it, it tells me God takes care of his people, not just those that work hard, not just those that, but he says, do not touch my child. The only thing you can do is lay a hand on him. And so, um, I don't know, the, the, that point of, like, man, Job was worshiping, he just literally was on his hands and knees worshiping the creator that literally Satan, that he allowed Satan to take that stuff from him. And he says, the Lord gives. And so for me is having the, I guess the peace to know, like, um, how would be to say this? The peace to know, like, understand that I, how I wrote this down, but I'm trying to, let me just look, read it. Uh, the peace to accept the things I can't change the courage to change the things I can and the wisdom to discern between the two. And so it's like, how can I be at peace on when God takes things from me? If it's, if it's a child or if it's a family member or if it's finances or if it's whatever, and how can I be okay with that? And so Job hung his hat on, blessed be the name of the Lord. Mm -hmm. Right. And he knew God gave it to me and God took it from me. And then Job chapter in the end of Job, what do we know God does for Job? Man, he returns that more than he had before, right? right? And so, that's good. anyways, that was... Just kind of like who you are with everything. Who are you if it, you didn't have anything? It's kind of like where your heart is. Job gets a little shout out at the end of... Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I like that. I like that. No, no, that's this week. Is that this week? Yeah, it's verse 11. Dude. Okay, my bad. Hey, look at that. It says, Ronnie. we give great honor to those who endure under, under suffering. Mm-hmm. For instance, you there know about Job, a man of great endurance. And I think even verse 10 is cool. Like, for examples of patience and suffering, because those are two different things, right? Patience in life and then patience when you're suffering. Uh, it's hard to have patience in general, which is something that I really struggle with because I do not have a lot of patience. And I especially don't have a lot of patience when I'm, like, going through something difficult. And I think, yeah, like you said, Job's a great testament to that. Um, Job being somebody who endured under suffering. Yeah. So this past month, I launched something that I've been working on for many, many months, and I'm so proud of it and so excited of it. So what it is, it's a 30-day workout devotional challenge. You can check it out on my website, 48.men, that's F-O-U-R-E-I-G-H-T dot M-E-N. And really what it is, it's 30 days of devotionals, and it's 30 days of verses and 30 days of workouts. So each one goes with each other. So there's a verse of the day, and there's a devotional that pairs with the verse. And at the bottom, I have a workout that... uh, is attached to, um, well, so the workout pairs numerically with whatever the verse of the day is. So for example, day 13, it's Matthew 26, 15, and it's a 26 minute AMRAP, uh, 15 burpees, 15 pushups, and then 15 dumbbell cleans. And like I said, you can scale that however you want to. And if you, you don't even have to do the workouts. If you just want to check out the devotionals, I uh, really believe in these devotionals. And for example, at, uh, day 13, it's titled Silver Coins, and it's based off of Matthew 26, 15, like I said. And it's just a whole devotional about how when G- when Judas betrayed Jesus for 30 pieces of silver, I uh, kind of equate it to how we trade Jesus for lesser things in our life today. So if you have downloaded it, go leave a review on my website. And if you haven't downloaded it yet, please go check it out. And like I said, if you have, you know, leave a comment on my social page, on my podcast page, and just let me know what you guys think of it. I want to hear uh, any feedback that you guys have to where if I make these in the future, I want to know what to change, what to tweak. So please go uh, leave a review and just... Um, DM me, comment on a post, and let me know what you guys think. So go check it out. It's a 30-day challenge, and you can go download it. It's a PDF, and it'll save to your phone. You can go save it to your notes or files or whatever you want to do. So go check it out, and I hope that you start training yourself spiritually and physically. Yeah, but I think that's where <clears throat> Jesus searches out our heart, and he knew Job's heart there, and he knew, like, saying, you take all he has, because I know at the end of the day, and it's like I've— Truly, if I ask God, like, okay, God, you take my family, you take my possessions, like, will I truly still call and worship you yeah. the same when I do have these things? Because obviously Job was worshiping God the same when he had all these right, things. Yeah. But then when he, and man, that's just so powerful that he was still worshiping the Father the same. And it says he didn't even sin in that. It's like, man, I know I would. I would definitely be I would, wrestling with me God. And, me and God would be, like, yeah. go, I would be pretty, 
You know, and I think there's nothing wrong with that, but it says Job didn't even sin in that action of when all this stuff was happening. So You haven't even said the worst part. No, I know. I'll go ahead. Imagine you get a wife that says, curse God and die. Yeah, yeah I wasn't going to talk about his old ranch. Oh, man, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. I mean, you got all that, then you got your wife over there that's like, what do you what are you doing? Curse God and die. Boy, she ain't a Proverbs 31 woman. No. Nah. Boy. <laughs> no, nah, she's not. She's a wench. But I mean, but even her response, like that's relatable. Like, yeah, no, no, but that's you know, I think like, we all, yeah, she gets a hard like, rap though. But I think she does get like, a hard rap. I would say, as good as women that we're married to, like when we like, there's there's times like they question like sometimes like what are we mm-hmm. like you know and so it's like we can give her a bad rap and like that but. Humanly, you got to think like she was just like any other woman that right. any other like, human, yeah, hu- yeah, human being that's ever been created. And so I think if I was on her side of it and looking at that, I was like, man, what the heck are you doing? Like, yeah. So I, I think that's if we're going to be truthful about it, that that probably is us sometimes with oh, any situation. Sure, yeah. You know, yeah. she was being honest about how she felt. Yeah, you know, like that's what I'm saying, she bore those children. She, you know, yeah. it's like that happens, and then your husband's over there. You know, not yeah, batting an eye and just like, yeah, It'd be yeah. kind of shocking. Totally, I don't know. It's a, it, it's, it's definitely it's, a very different headspace where he was at. Like, yeah, it, it's, it's like, interesting to look at it through a different lens than right. Yeah, you know, like that. But that it, tells you where Job's faith was, saying. man. Yeah. Like, he was anchored. You know, because how often there. we can hang our hats on our wives or our family, yeah. and like, man, the dude just truly. So, so, I was going to say, <laughs> uh-huh. yeah, I'll seek after the Lord. Are you going to say sick? I didn't know what you were saying. No, boy. <laughs> Not today. No, but yeah. We should pray to have that heart towards our I would definitely be wrestling. Because I think sure. that's where, that. man, when he was obviously searching out Job's heart there, but man, the beautiful thing is God God doesn't need us to tell, us, tell him what's in our heart. He wants us to share our heart with him. He already yeah, knows. Sure knows. And so, yeah. Us just going to the Father and saying, God, I know you know this, but still let me tell you anyway. So, right. like, here's where I'm struggling. I'm suffering. Like, mm-hmm. here's my intentions. I know my heart is can be, you know, wretched at times. Yeah, but, man, I need you to, like, be compassionate towards my, you know. And, and that's what he also talks about, that compassion in verse 11, isn't it? Uh, yeah. Mm-hmm. Talks about the purpose of the Lord, how he's compassionate. Man, you look at the whole <laughs> Old Testament and, man, God's mm. compassion and love and Mercy. Uh, patience with his people over and over and over and over and over, you know. And so, um, so yeah, that was, that was good in there. Yeah, patience and endurance. I mean, verse 7, it says, be patient. Verse 8, you too must be patient. And verse 10, it says, examples of patience and suffering. So I think just reiterating that. It's the part about being patient. Mm-hmm. Um, Cause yeah, I think that's something that we all I mean, struggle yeah. with. Job's life, it wasn't like it was like two or three weeks or a month of suffering. I mean, this guy's a big part of his life was suffering, and so right. I think that's yeah. like we think of patience and like man, we bring patient to you know, try to have kids. It takes a year or two or three or four, right. and this guy's like just lost everything and still being patient with God saying like blessed be the name of the Lord right. you give and you take uh, so yeah that's mm, that's some patience there boy yeah Job's such an interesting book yeah it's a great book it really it's is very it's I mean, talking about Bohemus in there and Bohemus the, yeah boy any Bugambis no Bugambis mm. but there is Bohemus mentioned in there right. I think I'm just trying to it. wait two hours in the morning to shoot a big deer yeah well I mean even like He's patient, and then he has all these friends who are, you know, kind of losers. <laughs> hey. And then that happens, and then he finally questions God, and then it's almost like God's like frustrated. So it's just it's it's an interesting, yeah, it's an interesting dynamic. Not, not that God's frustrated, but God, you know, obviously shows him, you know, the universe, and he's like, you know, who are you to question? Mm-hmm. So it's a very humbling. It is. But that shows Job's realness of human, too, of, like, man, God. And, like, because I feel like his patience was eventually starting to run out. It's like, and God still is like, son, where were you when I did this or created you and created the seven of the earth? And uh, so that also gives that Job was still human, too. <laughs> any any uh, closing thoughts from anybody? 
What do you think about your ESBS and Nomi Dow? I was thinking about, like we talking about, we've talked about this this whole series of James, but like when we do say yes to following Jesus, mm-hmm. or or we say no to sin, then do we live that out when we commit to say something? Because I think that's where, when I say, "Hey, I'm following you, Jesus," whenever we have that, like how mm-hmm. baptisms that public profession, saying, "Hey, like this is the new life I'm living." And from there, when you commit to yes, then how do we live out saying yes to Jesus? You know, because obviously I think that's where we, man, I swear to God, like I'm a Christian, or I swear, like yeah. when you're having to do that, maybe your actions aren't resent, like right. lining up with you saying, hey, I'm a follower of Jesus, right. you know? Mm-hmm. So that was just a, I don't know, a little thought of how can we be better at that? Because I feel like looking at it just like simple, just like today. Like Christian inviting us here, and we saying yes, coming here. Like the small things, like yeah. just meeting people on time, and like just if we can yeah. be somewhere when they can count on you, be there. If not, like, I'm just saying that it's the first step. I feel like easy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, thing like you said earlier, just be a man of your word. Just be reliable. If, you, if you're listening to this, be a woman of your word. Yeah. You say yes to something, and commit to it. And if you say no to something, then right. yeah, that's it. You know, yeah. stick to it. Well, if you're listening, we appreciate it. And uh, just some concluding, I think just kind of wrap things to wrap up with. Um, do not count on your wealth. Don't spend your years on earth satisfying your every desire. Do not grumble against each other. And uh, be patient in your suffering. Hope that you enjoyed today's episode of James 5. Meet us back here next week as we dive into verses 13 through 20. Hope that today challenged you and encouraged you, but also just, uh, yeah, made you look at your life and just ask those questions of, are you, um, you know, comfortable in, in, in money? Is, is that what you're serving? Are you striving after that? And, um, you know, do you grumble against each other? Do you, uh, you exercise patience in certain situations where your life may look like you're in suffering? So just to encourage you with that, hope that you guys have a great week and we'll see you back here next time.